Deutscher aber ist Deutschland, wie Deutschland Hitler ist. Hitler, Sieg, Sieg, The defendant that to plead guilty or not guilty to the charges against them. Rudolf Hess. That will be entered as a plea of not guilty. The prosecution presents a chart of the Nazi organization. An American lawyer explains the Fuhrer is the supreme and only leader in the Nazi hierarchy. And here he makes a slip. He says his successor designate was first the defendant Hess and subsequently the defendant Goering. Both Hess and Goering hear this in the German translation. And uh, Goering, as you may know, was a man of a great and enormous vanity. And uh, when he heard this coming over the translation system that uh, the American lawyer was saying that he was number three and Hess number two, uh, why Goering was immediately uh, uh, very much piqued and he began waving around and pointing to himself, ich bin die Zweite, I was the second. And uh, calling everybody's attention to the fact that, that he'd been demoted quite unjustly. Uh, well, uh, while Goering was going through these antics to try to call attention to uh, the true state of uh, affairs, uh, Hess looked over at Goering, who was sitting on his right, and uh, saw what Goering was doing. And then he leaned back and he laughed and laughed and laughed. And uh, this led me, at least, to believe that uh, Hess's amnesia was, in part at least, feigned. And I so expressed the opinion then. Hess seems happy. He writes to his wife, Dearest little mommy, my comrades recognize with joy I am still exactly the same man. But he has stomach cramps, says his guards are poisoning him. Co-defendant Albert Speer says, in German, what a screwball. During Hess's defense, the Nazis fear he will make fools of them. Goering is mocking. Another one asks, this is what Hitler called a political leader? Walter Funk says, seriously, it is not funny. He was really not a dyed-in-the-wool Nazi. That did not motivate Hess. What motivated Hess was his great admiration and affection for Hitler. Hess was um, a personality. He was not a leader at all. He was a follower, and he needed a father. Ed. Ashamed of Hess's naive personal offer of peace to Britain, of which he is most proud, Hess asked to make a final statement before the verdict. Einige meiner Kameraden hier können bestätigen, dass ich bereits zu Beginn des Prozesses... A large part of this uh, last statement of his, which uh, was about, oh, 20 minutes long, was very rambling and inarticulate, and had to do with uh, uh, how there are a lot of people around him while he was in prison in England who had glassy eyes and stared at him in a strange way. And much of what he said, uh, as I say, is incoherent and, uh, and uh, suggestive of profound abnormality in his mind. Uh, but after the court had said, you've been talking for 20 minutes and uh, time's running out, he then said at the end, uh, I was permitted to work for many years of my life under the greatest son whom my people has brought forth in its thousand year history, meaning Hitler. Even if I could, I would not want to erase this period of time from my existence. I am happy to know that I have done my duty to my people, my duty as a German, as a National Socialist, as a loyal follower of my Fuhrer. I do not regret anything. It is October 1st, 1946, the day of judgment. Hess will leave the court, strut to his cell, laugh, and say he did not hear the verdict and does not care what the sentence will be. Defendant Rudolf Hess, on the counts of the indictment, on which you have been convicted, the tribunal sentences you to imprisonment for life. Hess served that life sentence in Spandau Prison in Germany. His late years clouded in mystery and speculation. The strange case of Rudolf Hess will most likely never be fully explained or understood. If Hess had succeeded on the peace mission, Germany could have turned all its might on the Soviet Union. They ensure that he serves his full term in prison. Right up
out to the end, Hess remains in contact with his wife. People often believe that my husband is insane. Uh, from the letters he is writing every week to the family, uh, you can uh, say that if a man who writes such letters is insane, I should be definitely insane myself. He is the last inmate of Spandau Prison in West Berlin, where he dies at the age of 93 on August 17, 1987. But even his death is fraught with inconsistency. The official version is that he commits suicide by hanging himself. But some historians claim he is murdered. Autopsy reports state that marks on his neck indicate that he was strangled. In September of 2002, the Robert H. Jackson Center played host to Dr. John K. Latimer, an American physician who attended, observed, and spoke on a personal basis with the 22 top Nazi leaders on trial as one of the Nuremberg physicians. He has a unique story on the end of Rudolf Hess. Yeah. What, what was your take on him? Did, did was he was there complete amnesia here? Uh, no, he was pretty well over the amnesia, uh, in my opinion. I, from then on, I, I thought he was he was uh, what's the word? Uh, faking it uh, a lot of the time, and then of course they put him away. He was the only one left, and he had this little little hut out in the in the yard, sc screened hut and. Uh, uh, one day the nurses came back and found him dead, or almost dead, and he died almost right after. His, his, his son got a hold of me, knowing I'd taken care of him, and said, you know, you got to help me with this. And I said, well, what, you know, what can I do? And he said, well, I've had a second autopsy done, and, and you'll see it in my slides. The mark of the, of the thing that goes straight around his neck is when you're garroted. Somebody had garroted him. He hadn't hanged himself, and uh, he, he died. He didn't die at that moment, but he died a few hours later. And uh, uh, I said, well, uh, the United States authority on garroting versus hanging is so-and-so, and we'll get a hold of him. But this man said that, well, when, when you hang yourself, the rope comes up here, and it doesn't hit your thyroid cartilage. But if you, somebody garrots you, it breaks the tips off your thyroid cartilage. It's a straightaway uh, differential diagnosis. And his were broken off, just like if somebody garroted him. And the mark goes straight around his neck. And uh, it's no doubt that he was garroted. And uh, they, he was on the British, uh, we took turns being his guards, and he was on the British rotation. And everybody thought that the Brits let their Secret Service people knock him off so he wouldn't say anything about what had been going on with him to try and get him to talk when they had him as a prisoner for what, four years. And uh, uh, in any case, I got a hold of our expert in this differential diagnosis, and he wasn't clear that he wanted to have anything to do with it. And he said, well, when you're 86 years old or whatever he was. 90, yeah. 90, he said, uh, your tissues are so brittle that that breaking off thing is not really a valid uh, basis for the only comparison. So I couldn't do much for him. but. Uh, my own opinion is that somebody did garrote him and kill him. Right. To the man he admired most, he risked everything to restore his name. Instead, his mission ended in disaster. Any friends he may have had within the British establishment distanced themselves from him. Hess dies a deeply disturbed man. It was the ultimate failure for a man who risked everything to win. His fate sealed in a mysterious flight over 60 years ago.